My name is Johan Onderkamp, and in this presentation I will show that the pyramids in Gizeh, together with the Great Sphinx, form a clock that represents our third dimension of time. Let us first look at space. Space has three dimensions, we all know that. The x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. They show the breadth, height, and depth, and each, each axis has a positive and a negative value. Now look at time. Time has exactly the same three dimensions. Also, each dimension has a positive and a negative value. What are those three dimensions? Light means, positive means light and negative means dark. Let us look at those three dimensions. The first one is the daily time. We all know that. The second one is the yearly time. And we'll, show, we'll see that the pyramids are built to represent the third dimension of time, which is the great year. Plato used to call it the, the great year. In order to understand the basics, please go to this website, pateo.nl, the English section, and there you find a video presentation called The Holy Science. Please watch that first before you see this video in, understand to, in, order, in order to understand the dynamics of energies. The first dimension is daily time. Daily time is caused by the rotation of this planet. I call this planet Terra. Terra or, uh, rotates around her own axis. And that's why a part is lit and another part is dark. Daily time is divided into four parts. The night part, then we have the morning. The moment of sunrise is the demarcation between night and morning. Then we have the demarcation again, it's midday then afternoon, then the sun sets, and then we have evening, and it goes back again. This part, the light part, is the day part, and the dark part is the night part. In the middle of the day part, we find the midday. In the middle of the night part, we find the midnight. This is common sense to everyone. And we divide that into two times 12 hours, 24 hours in total. This is 12 hours, and then we have another 12 hours, 12 hours. This is going clockwise, this is going counterclockwise. That's why you see the hands of this clock go counterclockwise. This is all common sense too. Now let us look at the second dimension of time, yearly time. Also in yearly time we find the same four divisions. We have winter, then the moment of the vernal equinox, the start of that, we go through this zero point in the middle of the apple, and then we're in the spring. Then we go to the summer, and then we go to autumn. It's the same as in the daily time, but now it takes more than 365 times longer. The moment of the winter solstices, this moment, the orbit or the bow of the sun is the smallest one. It rises here and it sets here. And the top of this bow is the lowest one in the whole year. Then it goes up again. Every day it climbs a little bit higher and it makes a little bit wider. Until here, this is the equinox, the spring equinox, and then we go further and then we rise, rise at the summer solstices. That's the top one over there. On June, June 21, it's on the top. It stays there for three days and then it goes down again, all the way down, 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 until here, December 21. On December 21, it stays down for three days. We could say the movement is dead, and after three days being dead, the movement rises from the grave, re rebirthing itself and going up again every day. This is the light bringer, and the light bringer also means Messiah. So the Messiah is dead for three days, and then the Messiah starts to rise again. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Here we see the four faces and the sun Helios in the middle. The axis is a little bit, uh, makes an angle with the uh, ecliptic, and that's why we have the four seasons. In a year time, we see different stars behind the sun. We make an orbit around Helios with our light ship Terra, and we see different stars behind it, behind Helios. And we've divided that into two times six parts in 12 constellations. At the highest point of the day, we find the constellation of Cancer. And at the highest point of the night, we find the constellation of Capricorn. 
Those are the two extremes. And we see those extremes as the tropics, Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And the Sun, Helios, makes an orbit in between those lines in a full year time. Here we see the Sun, Helios, we see the Moon, Luna, and we see our planet Terra. When Luna is there, so it's one line, Helios, Terra, Luna, then we see full Moon, because the full surface of the Moon is lit by the light of the Sun and is bounced back to the surface of Terra. That is the dynamics we see in nearly a month time, because the name month is related to Moon. And here we see the 12 months. Originally, this was the first one. This was the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and this was the seventh one, September. Septo, septem means also seven. Octo means eight. Novem means nine. And decem, decimal, means ten. That's how we see it. Julius Caesar named this month after himself, and Emperor August did the same with this month. Yeah, but it's all related to the moon. This is maybe not common sense to everybody, because it's not a perfect circle, the orbit of Terra around Helios. It's an ellipse, but the Helios is not in the middle of the ellipse. It's a little bit offline. And that means on January the 3rd, Terra is closest to the Sun Helios. The distance is closest. It's called perihelion. And the other side, on July the 4th, the distance is the largest. The Sun moves with an incredible speed. If Terra would stand still on January the 3rd and remain on that position, then after seven days of time, the Sun would be here and Helios would hit Terra. We also see that this period, the autumn period and the winter period, is, is a one full week shorter than spring and summer. It's very interesting. Now let us look at the third dimension, the crate here. All the stars are moving, except for one, except for this star, Polaris, because Polaris is aligned with the axis of Terra. And we find it by using the Great Dipper and the backside, drawing a line, making it seven times as long, and then we find it easily. At this moment, the axis of Terra is pointing nearly towards Polaris. But about 13,000 years ago, it pointed to a totally different star, the star Vega in the Lyra system. And one full orbit because the Earth is like a tumbling, uh, is tumbling like this, a full orbit, a full tumble, takes 25,920 years. And Plato called that a crate here. And it's officially called the precession of the equinoxes. Now it's nearly pointing to Polaris, then it makes a circle, goes all the way here to Vega, and then it goes back through Tuban, and then to Polaris again. One full circle is nearly 26,000 years. Here we see the circle again. In the middle of the circle we find the constellation of Draco, dragon. And the tail, Tuban, is on the tail of the dragon. Please find a look that uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Rowling in the Harry Potter books refers to Draco, Draco Malfoy. Yeah, or it's, it's related to this, uh, th th this constellation. Here we see the 12 constellations again. So each period takes 2160 years. That's one constellation or one uh, eon or era or age. You can all use the same words. Yeah, one eon is this time. And three eons together form a great season, great winter or great spring. And the total is this amount, nearly 26,000 years. And we have each eon uh, after one another. We're now here, at the end of the Aeon of uh, Pisces, and we are about to enter the Aeon of Aquarius. Starting with the Aeon of Leo, we enter the Dark Period. This is uh, nearly 13,000 years of Dark Period. And when we enter the, the, age on, the Age of Aquarius, we start the Light Period again. So then we have 13,000 years of Light. It's very important. We could call this autumn, this winter, this spring, and this summer, but for the great year. Why is that cost? It has to do with the orbit the Sun Helios makes. We see here Terra orbiting around Helios in a full year time. 
but Helios itself also makes an orbit, and that orbit takes very long. The orbit goes clockwise, this goes counterclockwise, this one goes clockwise, and an orbit takes 26, nearly 26,000 years. And what is the reason for this orbit? It's caused by Sirius, also in the Harry Potter books and films. Sirius Black, yeah? I think Miss Ro Ronan knew about everything. Sirius is the dance partner, because those two stars keep themselves in, in, the, in the orbit of their, own, uh, of their own circle. Sirius also makes a circle. And when we draw a line, this line always goes through the middle of this. No matter where they are, the middle of this line is always here. And on January the 1st, Terra is exactly on that line. That's why we celebrate New Year. New Year is the realignment of Helios, Terra and Sirius. Many people who believe in Christianity use this symbol. What does this symbol mean? The symbol is just the overlap of this circle and the other circle. So this is in fact the orbit of Helios, of the Messiah, of the Lightbringer, that part. And that part is the orbit of Sirius, the other star. That's what the symbol in fact means. So it's very true. This is about the Messiah. But it's the Lightbringer. It's Helios. It's the Sun. At this moment, when Helios is here, and Sirius is here, and then the distance is closest. At the other time, when Helios is here, and Sirius is here, and the distance is furthest away. This is a demarcation line. Here we see another one. And we have now four periods. This period is called the Golden Age, the Golden Period. Then we have the Silver Period, then the Bronze Period, and then the Iron Period. We are now the end of the Iron Period, and we are soon to enter the golden period, the golden age. You can say this is spring, this is summer, this is fall, and that is winter. Let's draw new lines from this point where both circles meet through the center and also here where both circles meet through the center. Why is this so important? By doing so we divide the circle of Helios into six equal parts. What does that mean? The total was nearly 26,000 years, but if we divide it by 6, we get 4,320 years. This is a very important number, 4320. 432 will come back in many times. No, many people know about 432 hertz, uh, vibrations per second. It's a very important number, and it is in the precession cycle, in this great year time. Let's draw more lines. Yeah, we draw also these two. Now we get 12. 12 different parts. And these are, of, of course, excuse me, these are, of course, the eons or the ages. So we're now about to enter the period of Aquarius, the age of Aquarius, and at the other side we find the eon of Leo. And the clock of Giza is, is all about this third dimension of time, about the great year. I've been there myself, but the guy who was showing me around did not know exactly what he was telling about, was talking about. That's what I think. For instance, we find in the measurements of the Great Pyramid uh, a very special relation with the measurements of the total planet of Terra. The height is exactly related to the radius of Earth, and the circumference on the base of the pyramid is related to the circumference of Terra. And this is the ratio. Again, we see this number. The builders of the pyramid try to show us that this number is related to the precession cycle. That's why they use this ratio. At the base, the Great Pyramid has this, uh, this white, 440 cubits. A cubit was the unit of measurement the pyramid builders used. And the height is 280 cubits. When we add two, two sides at the base up and we divide it by the, le the height, we get a very good approximation of P, of pi, sorry, of pi. One qubit is between 25.35 meters and 25.36 meters. It's somewhere in between. Some say this, others say that. But it's the fact is, the truth is in the middle. Because one qubit is exactly pi divided by 6 meters. That is the shocking truth. The builders of the pyramid knew everything about pi. 
long before Archimedes discovered it, at least 22 centuries before. Maybe before Archimedes also people knew about pi, but this pyramid was much, much earlier built. So this is very shocking news. When we take the base of the Great Pyramid and we draw a circle inside, and we draw another one circle outside, exactly hitting the four corners, then we find the difference in length between both circles, this number. That is nearly, nearly exactly the speed of light in megameters per second. When we take the half of the base and we take the length of the, 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 the diagonal line, then we find pi, uh, we find phi, the golden mean. So the golden mean is present, the measurements of the earth is present, uh, the speed of light is present, all present in the measurements of the Great Pyramid. So what the pyramids builders did was show us this great here, and they gave us a lot of clue that they didn't build it by accident. There's a lot of symmetrical relationships inside. Most people know there are three big pyramids in Gizeh, but there are also a number of small ones. Here we see the three small ones, next to the smallest big one. This is a top view. Here we see the three bigger ones. This is the biggest pyramid. Here we see three small ones, and here we see another three small ones, and there are more. Here's even one more, and also there's one more. So in total, there are 11 pyramids next to the Sphinx. If you look carefully, you can see the Sphinx here, the Great Sphinx. Here we see a map of it. What does it mean? Let's count the small pyramids. Here we find three, here we find one, and here we find four. What does it mean? This means, of course, pi. The pyramid builders were showing us pi. Pi means the ratio between the circumference of a circle and the diameter. So let's draw that circle. Here we see that circle. It exactly hits the northeast corner of the big pyramid, the greatest pyramid. Also here, also here. And the sphinx is sitting, sitting with its bottom on top of the circle. So that can't be a coincidence. But there's more. When we draw a square inside the circle, there's only one square fitting horizontally inside the circle, and there's this one. It goes exactly over the sides of the Great Pyramid and also on the lower side, the east south side of the smallest, bigger pyramid. What are the odds? There's more. You can draw a diagonal from this point of the square to this point, and the diagonal goes straight through the middle, exactly through the middle of the middle greatest pyramid. Most people don't know about this point, and that's why they think this one is a little bit offline, and that one is totally offline. No, that's not true. It's exactly right. I think this map is not totally correct because the lines I'm drawing are not perfect. I think that in real, this line also goes to the top corner of that pyramid. Because this is a top view, but you can see the picture is taken from where from here, from the top. So you see a little bit not straight from the top. And this is what we find on Google Maps. Yeah, it's not a perfect match, but you can yeah, almost see it. So I think we should take a really good map and then redraw all the lines. When we draw a line from this corner to the bottom of the Sphinx, it goes straight to the middle of the lowest, bigger pyramid. By doing so, we divide the full circle into one-third and the other one is two-thirds. So that means that this is a side of a perfect triangle. Here we see it. And the other perfect triangle starts in the top pyramid in the t northeast corner of the biggest pyramid, of the Great Pyramid. So this is a very ancient symbol. It's a symbol, the seal of Salomo. It's very beautiful that it's present on the Kise Plateau. And why is that? Because it's a clock, and the clock goes this way. It goes counterclockwise. And the full circle is nearly 26,000 years. This is the moment Leo started. Then it became dark. And this is the moment where Aquarius will start, then there will be light. So this is the dark period, half a circle, and then a half a circle, a light period. What did they do to help us remind us about this, to help us interpret this, this clock? They built the Sphinx, the Great Sphinx. What does it mean? This is the body of Leo, of a lion, with the head of Aquarius. That is what, is this, what we see here. It's, it's very obvious, but we didn't see it for thousands of years. So what does it actually mean? This is a moment in time. What moment in time? How can we precisely know what moment it was? To help us find that exactly, exactly right moment, we have to look at the shafts in the Great Pyramid. 
and those shafts are aligned to certain stars. It's aligned, of course, to Sirius, the dance partner of uh, Helios. It's aligned to the lowest uh, star in the belly in the, uh, uh, of, of, of Orion, and Orion's belt. Sorry, belly, belt. And these two stars also, we first saw Tuban, we saw in the previous part, Tuban is on the circle of the procession, and also this one is related to the procession cycle. So the pyramid builders chose four stars to help us remind about the procession cycle. That's why they did it. The only thing we have to do now is to find the exact moment in time when those stars were perfectly aligned with the shafts inside the Great Pyramid, from the King's Chamber and the Queen's Chamber. And that moment, according to my calculation, is uh, 2309 BC. So we know that this moment is nearly 2300 BC. We just go back in time. We'll do that later. These three, I'm sorry, these three pyramids represent, everybody knows that because of the work of Robert Beauval, represent the stars in the belly, in the belt of Orion. And that's exactly what we see. We see here three stars horizontal. Yeah? They are horizontal here. What does that mean? That means that the stars of Orion in the belly, in the belt, were rising horizontally. And that was around 11,000 BC. Yeah, we saw them nearly all the same time rising above the horizon. So when we go back two times this period, 4,320 years, then we come here. 10,949 BC. That was the moment here. That is when Leo started. So that means that after periods, we are now here. After nearly 13,000 years. This is what we should see now. And that is true. When we look, when we take a picture of Orion rising, we see this formation. First one, this rises, then the second one, then, and then the third one. So that means that this is the current time. And that will be 2012. That is the moment when we hit the light period again, when we go to the age or the eon of Aquarius. So we had 13,000 years of darkness, and then we will have again 13,000 years of light. And that is the message of the pyramid builders. In 2012, the great year spring will start, bringing a bright new day. And that is why all the dark systems we have now, the money system, the control system, all the divide and conquer is going on, all those things will disappear. We will make a full new start. We will reinvent everything and we'll start a new way of living on this planet. That is the message of the ancient pyramid builders. Eight years before the ancient Egyptians came to live there. Eight thousand years. To find more about this, this is in a Dutch book, but I hope that the English version will be available very soon. Thank you very much. Namaste.